Traumatic brain injuries are the leading cause of death and disabilities in children in the United States. Despite these demographics, we have yet to define a therapeutic that would support recovery after an early age traumatic brain injury. Today, you will learn about Dr. Linda Noble's research to develop new therapeutics, specifically tailored to the brain injured child that will reduce early brain damage while supporting long-term cognitive recovery. Dr. Jessica Church Lang will follow with an overview of her research on adolescence and how different aspects of a child relate to their brain activity and academic performance. She will highlight her study of middle school English language learners, some of whom are experiencing reading and math difficulties, and how their brains may change in response to educational interventions. The second half of the program will feature a Q&A led by Dr. David Paytafar. Dr. Paytafar is a professor and the inaugural chair of the Department of Neurology at Dell Medical School. He is also director of the Mulva Clinic for the Neurosciences. Dr. Paytafar's clinical research program develops tools that allow physicians and researchers to track and predict the health of individuals and entire populations. This includes the creation of novel biosensors, signal processing algorithms, and user interfaces. His work enables clinicians to be more proactive by forecasting disease trajectories. This allows care providers to intervene earlier and better understand the effectiveness of various interventions. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. Paytafar, who will frame today's conversation and introduce our featured speakers. Uh, thank you, Angie, for that kind introduction and welcome everyone to this wonderful um, meeting and discussion. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Before I do that, I just wanted to say a few words about um, translational research and what it means to me. So, so I'm a practicing neurologist, a, a physician. Um, I see patients. I'm also a scientist. And um, so I, I have a very interesting way of thinking about this that I'm always excited to share. And that is that when I see a patient in the clinic, or when I uh, interact with individuals in the community or in a classroom or anywhere, I am thinking about how to improve their health, how they can, they are sharing intimate information about their world, their community, their experiences. And I'm thinking about, well, how can we help them be healthier? How can we reverse their disease or how can we make them more comfortable? And what I really wanna emphasize in my own experience and my own bias, really translational research embodies hope for patients and families and communities. It really is the embodiment of hope. It's an obligation of all of us to be thinking about how to address the cruelties. I mean, there are many cruelties that we are experiencing uh, just watching the news, the cruelty of COVID, social injustice, all of those cruelties are embodied in individuals who come to clinic or come to see clinicians. And we feel very strongly that ultimately, in order to understand their journey through life requires an understanding of liberal arts and humanities. And it's not just uh, biochemical pathways. It's not just um, engineering principles applied to tools. It's also who are these individuals? What was their educational level? What experiences have they had in their past? And what's their, what are their needs and wants? And that is the embodiment of hope. And I think that is what translational research means to me. And that is what the Mulva Clinic for Neurosciences represents. It's a platform, not only for providing services and care uh, to immediate needs, but also for discovery. And most individuals who come to the clinic, they want to participate in research. They want us as faculty to discover new ways to help not only them, but others with similar conditions. So that is what it means to me um, to think about translational research and specifically about um, the topic of today, uh, when someone sustains a head injury and they are in school and it disrupts their life it's not just the biochemical pathways of the, of the disruption. That is extremely important. And, and Dr. Noble will review some of that for us. 
It's also who are they? Where, what educational level have they had? What does it mean to them? And that really does uh, translate to liberal arts and humanities. Um, Dr. Linda Noble, I'm delighted to um, introduce her. She is a professor in the Department of Neurology, as well as a professor in the Department of Psychology in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, Linda's research uh, focuses on improving care and health outcomes for individuals who have sustained trauma to the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord. It's the long-term objective is to develop targeted therapeutics that will improve recovery after traumatic spinal cord and pediatric or childhood brain injuries. Uh, traumatic brain injuries are the leading cause of death and disability, as Angie mentioned, in children. And there's growing concern that even mild forms of traumatic brain injuries, including concussions, may have long-term adverse consequences. And so when I think of Dr. Noble and her work, it, is, it really embodies my concept of what translational research means, not just for advancing uh, understanding the condition, but the condition of, of uh, individuals who are suffering from this. Um, the next speaker after Dr. Noble is Dr. Jessica Church. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Church as an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and, a, and Behavioral Sciences and an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at uh, the University of Texas at Austin College of Liberal Arts. Um, Jessica has a strong interest in how cognitive um, processes develop over age from children to adults um, and how these uh, processes um, uh, are influenced uh, by uh, developmental milestones, including educational considerations. Um, also how atypical development uh, reveals the vulnerable aspects of cognitive development pathways. How can we get a deeper understanding of cognitive development by looking at atypical development? Uh, research in uh, Jessica's lab uh, uh, focuses on development of executive functions and reading in late childhood and early adolescence, extremely important uh, uh, for the topic of today. Uh, Jessica is uh, heads the uh, Austin Neuroimaging site of the Texas Learning Disabilities Research Center Project on Reading Intervention and Brain Change. The Reading Intervention Project focuses on brain and behavioral changes over the course of an intervention and then over the course of early puberty. So first I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Noble. Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, I believe so. Okay. So it's really, um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about uh, my research. It's something I'm very passionate about, uh, traumatic brain injuries in children, and I thank you for the invitation to participate. Um, so I, I begin here with an image of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And I do this because um, it helps to explain my interest in this subject. I've been, uh, I have studied traumatic brain injuries for a number of years, but um, sort of in the mid, um, mid close to 19, 2015 or so, um, there were, were news reports in San Francisco where I was uh, living at the time about children who were falling out of uh, windows um, uh, in the city. And uh, you can see um, I've got a chronology here of some of them that I've tracked even since uh, 2002. That may seem strange to you uh, that the, of these reports, but I remind you that you know, San Francisco has this lovely weather, but at times it can get very hot. And there are old buildings, particularly in the Mission District, where the windows span almost from the floor to the uh, ceiling. And the idea is you open up the windows to the front of the house or to the front of the apartment and to the back, and you get a good breeze that comes through from the sea. Uh, the challenge here, of course, is those windows go almost down to the floor. And so children who are not being watched very carefully can actually cantilever right over the edge of those windows. And it's honestly, it's happened a number of times. And 
this is probably more, this is me just uh, reviewing the, the news over the last uh, couple of days. So, so I read that my children were young at the time and I'm thinking to myself, um, well, first of all, it's, it's terrible that this is happening. We've got to prevent that. But on the flip side of that, what do we do with children who've had traumatic brain injuries? What's the pathway for helping to support their recovery? So I read the literature in depth and realized that there really wasn't much out there other than to reduce uh, mortality, which is good, but it's simply not enough. And with children of my own, it was agonizing to think of what I would do if I were in that situation. So I actually turned directions and moved from studying traumatic brain injuries in adults to looking at modeling that uh, in a laboratory setting. So this is just the shows the epidemiology of uh, traumatic brain injuries. And you can see that um, there is a high incidence of this in this young age group. Um, in fact, uh, traumatic brain injuries are considered the um, largest uh, population um, of subjecting to injuries that have poor recovery. They're the leading cause of death and disability in this population. So, um, and the primary uh, cause for this, bit ironically here, are falls, but secondarily uh, to motor vehicular accidents and the head being struck against an object. So, um, that's what we're faced with. This is what we try to deal with. And this is what we try to model in the laboratory setting. So I would just like to share with you a few tenants that guide our research. And I'll go into them uh, more in depth in the, uh, the rest of the slides. But the first is that not all traumatic brain injuries are alike. That when you compare the adult brain versus the pediatric brain, it's really like comparing apples and oranges. Time is brain. Um, and no researcher is an island. So the first tenet of no, not all traumatic brain injuries are alike. Perhaps it's important to realize that the most common description of traumatic brain injuries um, is heterogeneity. And that means that um, the way it presents itself, both um, from the damage to the brain to how it clinically presents, depends upon the nature of the injury. So an acceleration, deceleration injury can cause widespread damage throughout the brain, a specific kind, but you can also get focal injuries um, that cause discrete injury, but there are ramifications of that. And children, um, children that have both um, uh, acceleration and focal injuries do much poorer than children who just have one injury alone, which sort of intuitively makes sense. Um, how it presents depends upon the type of injury that's occurred, what part of the brain uh, it's, it's, uh, it's impacted, whether it's the frontal cortex, other parts of the brain, they will clinically present differently. Uh, the severity of the injury results in um, not only how uh, it may um, impact the pathogenic, pathogenesis in the brain, but, but it also influences clinical outcomes. Again, not particularly surprising. Uh, may be surprising to you that sex is a may play um, uh, a role in how a child recovers from injury. So there are sex differences in response to trauma. And then finally, um, it's the heterogeneity is uh, related to the number of traumatic brain injuries you've had. And that may sound ridiculous, but the fact is that, you know, probably the most visible head injuries these days are concussions. And uh, the Repeat concussions are something that everyone is studying. These are mild forms of traumatic brain injuries that have long-term consequences. So lastly, I just wanna say that the term heterogeneity really was based upon the fact of uh, work that by Kathy Satman and others, that if you look at CT or MRI of brains of individuals, even adult, and then look at their clinical outcome, it's not necessarily predictive. So, you know, these are the challenges that we're faced with. So a child's brain is not just a smaller version of an adult's brain. Um, so why are the young brains vulnerable to a traumatic brain injury? Uh, and it, it's a, due to a number of reasons. The, the first is if you look at this child, you have this large head, and then you have this, you know, this kind of small neck that's supporting this large head. So if that, um, if that child is subject to a acceleration, deceleration, type injury, how might that occur? Well, nowadays, most children are car seats, so we don't see that as much, but shaking baby is probably one example of how that is so dangerous to the brain because the neck can't withstand that movement back and forth. Uh, 
there are periods during brain development where the brain is exquisitely sensitive to any perturbations. So an injury at a time during these very sensitive periods can have profound long-term consequences. Um, the developing brain has a different biochemistry than the adult brain. So we have, um, we have uh, different factors in our adult brain that help to protect the brain against an injury. And in the developing brain, depending upon age, and we study the, the age equivalent to a toddler age child, these particular proteins are uh, minimally expressed in the brain. So uh, a similar type of injury to a, a young brain compared to an adult brain will have many, you know, a number of different consequences because the brain can't uh, adequately address the damage that's evolving over time. And one of the areas that's uh, really captured a lot of researchers' attention, including my own, is inflammation. So we think about inflammation as being important, for example, uh, in a uh, beneficial effect, if you cut your skin and your, your wound is starting to heal over, that, that healing process is dependent upon uh, the inflammatory response that helps to clean up the injury that was there and, and restore your, your skin to what, what it once was. The challenge here is the brain has a very distinct environment. It's, uh, it is, it is the, the brain is there, it's protected by what's called the blood brain barrier because that environment is specific to supporting the, the cells that are unique to that structure. So when you have a brain injury and it's associated with inflammation, the brain doesn't handle it very well. And those cells can be, that are the inflammatory cells can be very damaging. So in the developing brain, the challenge here is that the brain, that young brain is unable to handle this inflammatory response. And it has a, in fact, uh, it has a very uh, detrimental effect on how that brain can recover from injury. These are just a few examples of the differences between the young and, and the adult brain. So what do I mean by time is brain? I like to, uh, the analogy here is um, lightning and uh, striking a tree. Think of lightning as a traumatic brain injury and a tree is a cell in the brain that uh, could be potentially impacted by that. When lightning strikes a tree, it, it ignites. Um, and um, the challenge here is if that tree is alone, it stays as one event that's happened. But the, if there are a number of trees around there, they too can be, be influenced by the initiation of this event. That is a sort of a spreading um, damage that is caused in a forest. And the end result is you can get um, a forest that looks like this, which is equivalent to many cells that have died in the brain as a consequence of that initial insult. Um, we call that kind of a blossoming effect. The initial event that happens, that mechanical event that causes damage, and then the blossoming effect is all the other cells that were intact after injury that then begin to die as a consequence of that initial insult. So, so our lab is focused on blocking that progression, that secondary progression after that initial injury to help preserve the cells that weren't, um, were healthy, um, you know, at, right immediately after the injury, but potentially will go on to die. So uh, we study the mouse brain and this is what it looks like. It's a little bit different from the human brain, um, I must admit, but it has the basic elements that allow us to better understand how injury affects um, uh, the structure. Has, this is the cerebral hemispheres on either side, you see one. Sarah Bellin, we know is involved in motor learning, learning and memory up here. And this is the brainstem that has many essential functions, including that related to um, respiration. So if you, just draw a line to the brain and tip it on in. This is what it looks like in a, in a rodent. And it has similarities to that of the human as well. This is the, the hemispheres on either side. We call this the cortical mantle. And this is the hippocampus. This is a structure we're interested in because it has a profound effect on learning and memory. So why do we study the mouse brain? Because there are all these genetic models that allow us to see things we could not see in a human brain or a non-human primate. Um, this is just one example. It's called the rainbow mouse, where all the cells in the, in the hippocampus, and we're seeing, just to orient you, this, these cells in here are color-coded, genetically color-coded, which tells us who they are and who their neighbors are. And that becomes important as we, as we try to define the vulnerability of some of these cell types to a traumatic brain injury. 
There's also tools like the Allen uh, Brain Atlas that allows you to understand the connectivity from one cell to another in the brain. And it's that connectivity that is impaired after traumatic brain injury. So it provides us with this high resolution over time to map what's happening in the brain after these injuries. So imagine a traumatic brain injury, a focal injury, say here, what, what you'll see is you'll see this a defect in the cortical mantle, a loss of tissue, and then the hippocampus, which I've highlighted here, begins to die over time. It's not initially, those cells are not initially dead, but it progresses to this cell loss. And we can map it in the hippocampus by looking at these cells that are staining green, which are indicative dying cells. This is the hippocampus again. These are the cells highlighted within this area here that are dying within a day after injury. Not immediately after the impact, but that injury is expanding into these zones that were intact after that injury. And by seven days, this is the site of the impact in the histology of the rodent brain. You see this uneven um, staining. These are all cells in the hippocampus, but some areas are lighter. That's because this is an area where there's cell death by seven days. So we have this progressive loss of cells over time. I think a point that emphasizes the fact that traumatic brain injuries um, trigger neurodegenerative problems. So no researcher is an island. That means that we cannot do this work alone. Those of us who, who, who uh, spend our lives in laboratories, we actually work with teams of scientists and clinicians to tackle this problem. And this is just one example. The special issue that um, uh, I served as a guest editor on, published in 2019, that brought together clinicians and scientists throughout the United States, 16 institutions, including several outside of this country, to write the most up-to-date uh, commentaries on what we know about pediatric traumatic brain injuries. It's this type of communication that we need to make sure that our research is, is focused and addresses the key uh, clinical problems. And lastly, I'd just say, you know, our job, uh, my job in my lab is to protect those cells that were intact initially after the injury and to restore function through this informed discovery. We rely on feedback from our clinician um, partners um, and we, um, we focus on targets that may be amenable to therapeutics such as pharmacologics that may protect those neurons uh, in the acute stage after injury. And we have measures that will tell us whether that has long-term behavioral consequences, such as improved learning and memory in this animal model. So this gives you a pathway from protecting the brain to establishing that that has a good preclinical outcome. So that ends my presentation and I'll turn this over, I think, to Jesse Churchlang. Thanks so much, Linda, that's great. Um... I will share my screen here. Okay, so I'm really happy to speak to you today a little bit about my work and thinking about the developing brain. I thought Linda's presentation was so fascinating to think about brain injury because it's about relearning and recovery, whereas um, my work is kind of focused on initial skill learning in the beginning. So, you know, I am really interested in studying how we read and why that process is challenging for many children. Um, so if we kind of think about how the brain learns to read, we actually know a fair am amount about it. So say you want to read aloud to a group of kids, what is happening in your brain? What do we think we understand at this point? You're looking at these seemingly random little squiggles on the page and you want to turn that into language, right? Um, so we take the visual information, we're looking kind of at the side of the brain and I have a little model of an eyeball there looking at a book. Um, and that visual information travels from the eye through the thalamus to the back of the brain um, where visual information is processed. And we wanna get it all the way to the kind of articulatory processes of language up here. So how do we think the brain does that when it's reading? Well, we actually think that as you learn to read and as you read, you activate two processes simultaneously. One is you use a kind of sounded out approach. So this is the phonetic learning of language. It's absolutely key when you're an initial beginning reader to learn to take those little segments of squiggles and translate them into sounds. 
right? So that process is happening through a kind of dorsal pathway in the brain. And then we think there's a visual recognition mechanism that's related to high degrees of fluency that you just recognize words and context really quickly and allows for that speed reading um, that you can see through the kind of ventral pathway. But the two different pathways of the brain really rely on each other. And we think the dorsal route, the sounded out route, trains up that bottom visual recognition route. And we know this from various studies. Oh, and then you get to read aloud. It was the best of times. I forgot my little um, speaking part to kind of close that loop. So we know a lot about the brain and how it reads from measures of structural MRI, where we look at the size of different brain regions or the thickness of the cortex in different brain areas. We know it from task or functional based magnetic resonance imaging MRI, where we look at how the brain changes over time and how it engages in different tasks like reading, reading comprehension or rhyming or other word games. And here, the hot spots of the brain, the yellow, are places where the brain is significantly engaged while children are reading sentences and deciding whether those sentences make sense or not. So you can see kind of dorsal and ventral kind of pathways, the top and bottom through the brain here um, in yellow. And we also know a lot about the reading brain through studies of diffusion where water molecules travel that kind of identify the fibers, the bundles of connections that link different brain regions to each other. And you can measure the integrity of those fiber bundles or the thickness or the size as well. So we think we've kind of understand the general process about how the brain learns to read, but why does it go awry in you know, more than 15% of people? And we still have a lot of other questions that I think are super important. So um, some of them are, how does the brain learn to speak um, different languages, right? What does this look like in bilingual learners as they learn to read maybe in their non-primary language if they learn a language other than English first, but then they show up in English speaking schools and learn to read? Um, they often encounter a lot of difficulties. So does that look different than monolingual struggling readers or similar? And then another question that my lab is particularly focused on is how do control regions of the brain, the part of the brain that control our actions, that keep us on task, that respond to mistakes, how do those relate to the reading process and maybe give us some insight on new ideas for intervening or changing the reading brain or helping it to improve. So my lab primarily studies cognitive control development that term is a loaded term. It goes by a lot of different names. Um, you might be most familiar with it as executive function development, but we are really interested in how um, moment to moment processing is kind of steered, how kids achieve their goals, how they come to perform tasks successfully. And we're really interested in how that developmental process relates to mental well-being. So we study children with different cognitive disorders such as ADHD, or Tourette syndrome or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, but also how more and more my lab is really interested in how these control regions interact with academic skill development. So how math ability and reading ability and success in school relates to these control systems in the brain. And we think this is really important because it's part of everything we do. And, you know, reading comes to be a lot of different control sessions um, aspects, if you think about it. So you have to remember the reading direction for the language that you're reading in. You have to self-monitor your comprehension. Are you understanding what you're reading? You have to relate your reading to a larger context. You have to remember pronunciation errors you may be made in the past and remember exception words that don't follow those sounded out rules and can lead you astray. Right, so as part of the Texas Center for Learning Disabilities Project, which is headed by Jack Fletcher in Houston, we are really passionate about trying to improve outcomes for kids who struggle academically. And I head the neuroimaging team, the MRI team in Austin, along with my colleague, Jennifer Jurenek, who heads the Houston neuroimaging team. And our goal is to understand how the brain learns in children and how the brain maybe predicts different outcomes in different groups of children. So 
we like to take pictures of their brains prior to academic interventions and then work with the Meadow Center here at UT to design academic interventions administered within the school system and then take pictures of children's brains after they go through that process and look at who responded to that intervention and how did their brain change versus children who maybe didn't improve as much as we would have hoped. What are the kind of differences going on there and can that shed light into optimizing interventions for more children? So our primary tool that we use in my lab is functional MRI. Um, it has a lot of advantages. It doesn't have any radi radiation. It's considered very low risk, minimal risk for children. You can do it repeatedly with no harm. Um, it has great spatial resolution. We can get really precise localization in the functioning brain. Um, we can look at it at a three-dimensional whole brain level. But it has a lot of downsides too, especially from an educational perspective. We can only do one kid at a time, so I can't take a whole classroom and measure them simultaneously, which would be ideal. It's very expensive to use, it's complicated and slow, and it's super motion sensitive and sensitive to artifact from metals like braces, which in this age group you might imagine is a frequent um, problem that we have to exclude children for, at least from the MRI piece, that we can study them a bunch of other ways. But we can use this tool um, to study children who are good at reading or struggle with reading. And a study I just wanted to provide a brief snapshot about for um, this presentation just today is about our work with middle school English learners, which is a label applied by a school district when children's English fluency isn't as high as they would like. They're not passing a particular threshold. And a lot of them struggle with math and reading skills in their non-native language. And we were really interested in how language fluency, math engagement in the brain, reading engagement in the brain, and these cognitive control regions interact. So um, as you might imagine, this is a growing population in US schools. It's understudied and they have high rates of learning disabilities. Um, we were able to recruit 70 children from our first wave of data collection who have all Spanish speaking backgrounds. The parents were almost majority monolingual Spanish speakers. They're very low income. They were coming from wide areas around Austin, Texas, which made it challenging as far as ensuring they had adequate transportation to get to the MRI scanner. Um, wishing I could tow one along with me that had really sophisticated good signal and stuff is one of my dream scenarios, right? There, it's fixed in place and that's really important. But we had a huge range of English fluency and as well as in reading ability. So 60% of those 70 kids struggled with reading. And we're going to go into a um, intervention as far as uh, reading ability over the course of the school school year. So what this looked like is we recruited them to come in and participate in an MRI scan in the fall of their sixth or seventh grade, and then to come back and get a return scan in the summer after that school year, while they had a reading intervention in between. I just want to focus a little bit on this pre-intervention data that we've collected and just share a little bit about it. It's still underway and we're still working on it, but it's just kind of hot off the presses thinking about bilingual struggling readers, okay? So what we have them do inside the scanner is play a bunch of different games. We have them do two different types of reading tasks where we ask them if words rhyme or if words visually match. And then we have them do addition problems and subtraction problems inside the scanner while we take pictures of the brain and look at what parts of their brain are being engaged while they do these things. And then we also have them do a cognitive control related task. So we have them task switch between sorting things by shape and sorting things by color. So it has no academic um, relevance necessarily, but it's driving those control regions so that we can understand how the control networks of the brain relate to these reading and math responses. And what we see, if we look at activity in the brain that's bigger for math in red here, you can see what we typically think about as a math network in the brain that is commonly reported in the parietal lobe and in kind of controlly related regions to do these addition and subtraction problems. And you can see the kind of dorsal and ventral activity in the blue here for activity that's more driven by the reading task by these um, English learners, middle schoolers, looks very similar to monolinguals as well. But let's look at um, 
what the brain looks like across all three tasks. And I think what is really interesting is how consistently the control regions are being driven across these three different tasks that we're having the children do. So here I'm showing you overlaps of different colors coming from the reading task, the math task, and the control task. And black here represents engagement across all of those different tasks in these kids. So these regions are being driven by all three tasks and we think are part of the kind of core control network. So these English learners are really utilizing control skills in order to perform reading and math abilities. And further, during the task switching cognitive control task, the amount of activity, the amount of reliance that they have on the control system really relates to their out of scan or standardized measures of reading fluency that you would do in the classroom. So we see um, greater reliance on these control regions if their reading fluency is poorer. So they have to work a bit harder. And we can basically measure that inside the scanner and see that ripple out in testing outside of the scanner. And similarly, we can see relationships to English fluency in green during the reading task and Spanish fluency in math during the per like kind of red region there during the math task. And so we're exploring these relationships between language fluency, controllability, and academic outcomes. And we're really excited about it. So the process from ABCs to fluency can be really challenging for many students. And we're really interested in understanding that more. The reading and math performance really relates to cognitive control engagement in the brain. And so the study of cognitive control, like my lab does, really helps us learn about the relationship between age and academic ability and outcomes and hopefully helps us improve that. And I really think English learners are important to study as a growing population in US schools that might need more targeted interventions. So if you're interested in more information about the Texas Learning Disability Center, you can go to this website here. And I just wanna thank my lab who I haven't seen in person for about a year, um, but they're really working hard. And I am so appreciative of all their efforts. As Linda said, it's a team science. And of course, all of our funding sources and the Texas Center for Learning Disabilities. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. You know, how does early development of language. And in your case, Jessica, it's the acquisition of reading, which you've been studying. So we could really focus it to that. Um, it's, a, it's several sub questions. One is, um, you know, tell us more about the critical window effect, you know, the critical window of acquisition. And why is it that some people, um, you know, uh, are able to acquire new languages later, but it is generally harder so this window that's early in life and later in life, what's known about that? Um, also, the, 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 um, the, the question, uh, one of the sub questions is, um, how can you, in terms of reading different kinds of things like reading music, does that help? How does that relate to reading words or you know, reading numbers that have a different uh, symbolic meaning, numbers, digits? So those are all reading, but how do they relate to each other? And then finally, this relates a lot to uh, Linda's area. How does, how does TBI disrupt the learning of reading and language? What's known about that? And, and, and so these are a bunch of questions that relate to this theme. Yeah, so there's obviously a lot in there and I will just skim the very surface, but I'd be happy to answer questions via email or to chat further. Um, but basically, one of my favorite findings about the developing brain is that babies appear to be born as universal speakers and listeners. They can hear all the sounds of languages around the world. And we think that the brain is, does that to be flexible to the environment it finds itself in, to be adaptable. And by the end of the first year of life, the brain is really specializing to the sounds that it's hearing and it's kind of focusing its language learning skills to the native language where the baby is growing up. And, you know, carrying that forward, what we see is just kind of slowly reducing plasticity over the childhood period, which partially explains why, you know, post puberty, when we think a lot of the brain is really kind of 
hardwiring the stuff that we're using the most, it becomes harder to learn newer things, though it certainly can still be done, but you don't achieve that kind of native level of fluency that you can as a child. And um, the same kind of is true with how much improvement we can get at reading, which is why there's so much importance in identifying struggling readers early, because we have with interventions, bigger success younger than in older children. So kind of thinking about plasticity and maybe Linda can comment about recovery from injury in the same kind of way, we're thinking about, you know, earlier interventions, earlier identification, but, you know, realistically that doesn't happen for everyone. So by middle school, if you're still struggling, what can we do for you? And how can our understanding of the brain really help us utilize the tools that we have to help children succeed? And as far as you know, music and other languages as adults and things, I think it's all wonderful. There's a lot of studies of how rhythm knowledge and experience with rhythms and the idea of music themes can really help children um, learn languages and proceed academically, but it's not my exact area of expertise. Yeah, I, I, I would comment on the clinical side, we've learned enormously from individuals, uh, these are mostly adults, um, who've had uh, very um, specific stroke syndromes that have caused them to have um, deficits, not only in reading, but other aspects of language, speech production. So th this has been very, you know, this is fairly common and fairly large amounts of uh, numbers of patients with different kinds of language problems. And the use of rhythm and music has been used as a very practical tool for, so for example, uh, just recently, uh, within the last few months, I saw a patient who was unable to speak at all, um, and uh, but could uh, could sing, uh, and then we would add words to the to the song, and that's how they started recovering language or speaking. Um, and there are also other analogous kind of stories and studies on um, reading as well, and in in a in in a very different context. But that gets us to Linda in terms of both the window of vulnerability, uh, you know, with the window of acquisition of language, how does that relate to the window of vulnerability that you describe in TBI? And then, um, and then how does that relate to later in life and your very compelling story of how you got interested in um, head injuries, uh, brain injuries in young, young adults and young, young folks? Well, I guess I would start by saying that um, that vulnerable period extends uh, by translate from animal models to humans. Um, in the animal models, it extends up through adolescence, where um, you know the brain is undergoing these changes, developing new profiles that will help protect the brain against injury. The learning patterns um, early extend; it's durable. You injure the brain at a young age, there are long-term consequences of that. Um, the idea that the, the developing brain is plastic is true, but when it comes to traumatic brain injuries, plastic is not fantastic. These children grow up to have um, long-term cognitive deficits. I also, even though you know we've been interested in learning and memory, I want to point out the fact that, um, that a lot of the injuries in in children are to the front of the brain, the frontal wall, which is really Im involved in socialization. So um, you take these children after they've recovered from their traumatic brain injury, if they've had a, an injury to this, this part of the brain, uh, you put them in a, in a social setting like with their classmates and they're still very young and uh, no one can relate to them. They seem odd and they have a hard time communicating with their classmates. So, you know, you think about learning and memory. Uh, well, there's direct effects on that, but there's this indirect uh, challenge that these kids are facing to try to be uh, accepted by their peers, which is, I think, very challenging indeed. Yeah, I had a question that... Um something I've always been curious about as a bird watcher and also watching now that I'm in Texas, more ranch animals. Um, there are certain animals that um, have sort of self-inflicted head injury is the way I see it. But you know, like, like uh, you know, the woodpecker outside our window is pecking away. And to me, that looks like self-inflicted head injury, but they seem fine. They seem relatively uh, resistant to that kind of pretty striking uh, impact that's repetitive. And then the ram, 
you know, the, the, some of the, um, the uh, animals that we watch, uh, rams in particular, have enormous impact that they are as part of their behavioral uh, repertoire. And do they, is there something different about them biologically that they're resistant to brain injury? Um, well, that's beyond my knowledge, but I will say this, that it depends upon what you need to survive. So uh, if only a portion of your brain needs for a ram or a bird to survive is to be able to locate where the food is and to be pretty good at avoiding their predators, maybe that doesn't take a lot of brain mass to accomplish those tasks. What we're talking about here are uh, in some cases uh, gross, but also some changes in the brain that affect how you know that critical part of your thinking that makes you who you are um, and how you communicate with others. Um, so, you know, if you, if you gave me, um, uh, a ram that it had a brain injury, I would want to study that, that ram in detail. I'd want to check to see how, how well they could remember it. So, and I just think that they, they don't need a lot to survive. Yeah. Interesting. Is there evidence that, um, some humans are more resistant to the effect of, of an impact than other humans, uh, just in terms of their genetic makeup or other, just other factors? Um, I think there's, there's, there's modest evidence. It's a really interesting question. It, it speaks to resilience and what defines resilience, um, you know? Uh, so uh, it's, it's unanswered. Uh, I, I guess the, the challenge here is, you know, how would you do that kind of study? You would have to have individuals who have a very similar kind of a head injury and no other problems, no other, you know, uh, comorbidities that would affect that. Um, and that's probably far and few between. Yeah, um, I have a question also um, for Jessica, and that is um, a fairly common difficulty is dyslexia, which I, I realize is probably many syndromes, but maybe could you say a few things about what kinds of interventions and what you, from the model that you presented today, how would those interventions improve um, uh, an individual who has dyslectic, uh, you know, difficult, you know, struggles and how to overcome those struggles? Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the biggest, most successful reading intervention approach that we have is via that dorsal phonetic emphasis. So really working on translating the units of phonemes into sounds and letters into sounds and really focusing on that kind of missing link and training programs and educational programs that teach phonology and really emphasize that have better success with reading outcomes. Um, but there are a lot of other strategies that we can kind of wrap into that that sometimes involve executive functions. So just stop, check your understanding. Like, is this what you expected would happen? Like, what do you predict will happen next? And trying to help children kind of wrap in their other skills and bring those to bear in the reading process. And I think that's why it's so interesting to study the reading brain because the brain doesn't read without instruction. You have to pretty much be taught and or exposed to a whole bunch of reading to pick it up. Most people have to be taught in some specific way. And so how does the brain change to do that? And why is that not so successful for everyone? And how do we improve those outcomes? So that's kind of a big aspect that we're interested in. And I see a question from the chat about what age is considered an adolescent. And then a question for Linda in there. Um, we generally consider adolescence as starting when puberty starts, but where that how you mark that is even up for debate. So there are signals that start, you know, as early as eight or nine, um, primary before the kind of primary pubertal signals. But um, there's kind of a, a bigger question, Linda, in this about when do we shift to adult TBI therapy versus child TBI therapy? Um, well, I guess one has to look at those periods of vulnerability in children, which would take a very tailored type of therapeutic that you don't see in the adult. Um, but it's, it's not a, um, you are, um, you are young, you're adolescent, you're adult. It doesn't, it's a continuum that ultimately leads to adulthood. The one thing I think that is striking um, that when I teach my freshman class here uh, about the brain is that it's continuing to de develop up through late twenties. There's still 
uh, producing cells that are called uh, that, that produce something called myelin, which is important for how cells communicate with each other. There we call them myelinating brains. And so, uh, you know, if you think about how you're going to treat, you have to remember that even all the way up to uh, late twenties, those are still developing brains. So whatever you are going to use as a therapeutic may not be ideal for that age group. Are those children? Well, from a pediatrician's point of view, I think a child is up through 18 or 19 years of age, but from a therapeutic point of view, it could be very different. Yeah. So we have some questions uh, from the audience that relate thematically to the educational process here at UT. Uh, one is a great question. Can you please discuss uh, how critical graduate students are to your research? How, how does that fit into your research uh, in terms of making um, discoveries, advancing our mission? Oh, it's absolutely critical from my view. So, you know, when working with families and children, we need a lot of hands. So we have to they often bring siblings and families. So we have undergraduate researchers involved in recruiting and calling and screening and helping to entertain um, siblings and collecting behavioral data. And then the graduate students are really the machinery that makes it all happen. Every scan has multiple people attending. They have to acquire the data. The data needs a lot of processing to be usable and we have to do a lot of quality assurance. It goes through a large pipeline in the lab um, that all of the graduate students get trained on and then they do the primary analyses. And I view my job as helping to guide the questions, catch mistakes, and kind of promote their thinking about it. But I really view them as advancing our knowledge much more than I personally do. And I'm just privileged to witness it and help guide it along. Linda? Uh, yeah, I just like to add to that, that I love my graduate students. And my philosophy is that they work on projects that they have a passion for under the umbrella of traumatic brain injuries, but the types of questions that are really of interest. And we have one, and the graduate students that are coming to me are from psychology, so they have that bent to begin with. One of the, one of the students is looking at um, uh, predictors of recovery after an early age traumatic brain injury and the confounding factor of early life adversity. So children who are raised in an environment that um, where there is some type of adversity, it could be food shortage, it could be maternal separation, the mom works three jobs a day and is a sole mom taking care of that child, the added stress to that young child and to that brain that's developing. If at, a, at another period of time during brain development, that child has a brain injury, will it be more difficult for them to recover? And, that, and that's her project. And there is a tremendous interest in this because of this issue of not knowing why some children respond better after traumatic brain injury than others. It's data that's not typically collected when they're admitted to a hospital, but maybe a key, early life adversity may be a key determinant of how that child recovers after that injury. Well, I think we have time for a last question from the audience that's very important and um, I can begin to answer it, but I'd like all the panelists to address it. Can you tell us more about the partnerships underway between Dell Medical School and the College of Liberal Arts, uh, particularly around psychiatry and psychology? Um, so I, I'll just start that and that sort of builds off of what Linda and Jessica said, which is that um, Really, the um, medical school is devoted to educating um, our future um, clinicians, our physicians. And in the curriculum, there is a year, the third year is a year of discovery. And that's what they call it, actually. And that's an opportunity to work um, on a translational clinical problem uh, with faculty members and um, the, the very strong partnership between um, the clinical neurosciences and psychology um, is a wonderful uh, opportunity for medical students to collaborate with their counterpart, graduate students, and with our, um, our, our, our scientific uh, community to advance their education. So I think that's one area that is extremely important and already has had traction um, with, uh, with the medical school. Um, and, um, but maybe we could go uh, next to uh, Jessica and Linda and just discuss, um, you know, your thoughts on how we can strengthen this bridge that we're building between 
um, liberal arts and, um, and medicine. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really productive and highly energizing group of people across those two areas. And we, my most interaction centers around the Biomedical Imaging Center, which is our shared set of tools that different people who are studying humans of various sorts using MRI are sharing. And being able to collaborate with people at Dell Med with their expertise in disorders and diseases has been really informative to me and then helping you know, kind of collaborate training and cutting edge techniques and how we approach the brain has been, uh, for me, the exciting part of the collaborations between the two. How about you, Linda? I guess what I really like is the, well, I think the small working groups that have formed as a consequence of sort of the relationship expanding between psychology and Del Med, um, the ability to meet with people that you didn't know what they did. You kind of had an idea, but in these small group discussions, you learn more and realize that there's potential for collaboration or new investigations based upon what you've learned from your colleagues working in a somewhat different area. Well, I'll, I'd like to kind of wrap up with, actually it's a question from one of the audience members is, um, you have opened up so many questions. You have provided a fascinating overview. Thank you. Will you provide the second installment to this webinar? <laughs> so, um, so we thank you for that comment. And uh, actually, um, I think we should uh, talk a little bit about um, the overall uh, uh, program today. And I just wanted to wrap up by first thanking Jessica and Linda uh, to thank the College of Liberal Arts for their partnership and collaboration. And then uh, really maybe perhaps we can um, use that last question that was posed by an audience member to uh, perhaps uh, think about ways we can continue this interdisciplinary work, uh, not only for uh, uh, breakthrough research, translational research, uh, uh, but also education, our educational mission and our link to the community. And um, I also want the listeners and the audience to um, think about the Mulva Clinic for Neurosciences as a wonderful platform for learning, discovering, and really um, continuing our tradition of, of installing in a, a feeling of hope to patients and their families that we are doing our best to not only give the best care available, but also make discoveries that will matter to them. And I think that really is comforting to, to many in the community that we are doing that, we're devoted to it, we're taking all our possible resources to, to do that 